I get the privilege of just bringing a message that God has laid on my heart. And uh, I posted on social media this week that this message has been brewing for quite some time. But I was just waiting on the time to release this. And I feel uh, beyond any doubt that today is the day that God wanted me to release this word. And I'm, I'm sharing this word with these 17 students. You are more than welcome to listen in. And if you're watching online, you are more than welcome to listen and be a part of this message. But I just want you to know, this is a message God laid on my heart for these 17 students. We're going to go to Acts chapter 7 in a few moments. As always, the notes are available to you on the Refuge app. And I would encourage you to take some notes today because I really feel like this is a word from God for this house, for these students. The number 40 is significant in many ways. And we're going to talk in a moment about the spiritual significance of that number. But before we do that, let me just give you some useless trivia about the number 40 that will cause you to just wow your friends. For example, the number 40 is the only number that when you spell it out, the letters are in alphabetical order. And everybody said, ooh. I told you, you can wow your friends with this stuff. It's amazing. The, the temperature 40 below is the only temperature in both Fahrenheit and Celsius that is the exact same. It's the same temperature on both of those scales. You're fast learners. You catch on really, really quick. That's awesome. There are 40 spaces on a Monopoly game board. A typical pregnancy is said to last nine months. We know that's not true. It lasts 10 months or 40 weeks. It took chemists 40 attempts to create the magical spray that we know as, wait for it, WD-40, water displacement 40, 40 attempts to come up with that. Also, the standard American work week is 40 hours. You want to take a guess from today until RDS graduation, how many weeks there are? No, there's 38, but that's the best we could do. I tried hard to figure that out. 38 weeks from now until RDS graduation, but the number 40 is also significant in Scripture. It's mentioned over 150 times throughout the Bible, and it generally signifies three things. You ready? Testing, trials, and triumphs. Let me give you some examples. The Israelites wandered 40 years in the wilderness, and in those 40 years, they experienced tests, and they experienced trials, and they experienced some triumphs. Matthew chapter 4, Jesus fasts for 40 days, and in those 40 days, he's tempted by the enemy, and he experiences, experiences tests and trials, and he triumphs over the enemy. Moses fasted 40 days and 40 nights on Mount Sinai. And while he was fasting, the Israelites below are fashioning false idols and engaged in sexual immorality. And they began to doubt Moses' leadership. But yet, Moses experienced great triumph as a result of his obedience. Genesis 7, God floods the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. The Philistine giant Goliath mocks the Israelites for 40 days until a young shepherd boy by the name of David marches out onto the battlefield and experiences a great triumph over Goliath, not just for himself personally, but for the nation of Israel. In Jonah chapter 3, God gives Nineveh 40 days to repent. We're going to go to Acts chapter 7 in just a moment. 
And, and as we do, we're going to examine a story that's found in the Bible, and there's going to be a correlation that I'm going to help you make in a moment between the significance of 40 and this word that we find over 100 times in Scripture, wait. W-A-I-T, not W-E-I-G-H-T. The title of my message for these students today, and you're welcome to listen in, is Placed on Hold. Placed on Hold. We're going to go there in Acts chapter 7, but before we do, listen, that, that word wait is not a word that we cozy up to very often. We don't cuddle up to that word because for most people, it's a word that we resist. It's a spiritual discipline that's often neglected. The bottom line is this, we're impatient people and we don't like to wait. We don't like to be placed on hold. But let me tell you, as your pastor who loves you, there are some great benefits to waiting. And we find those all throughout Scripture. Like, for example, Isaiah 40 says, when we wait on the Lord, what happens? We renew our strength. Also, as we are in those seasons of waiting, the promises of God are fulfilled in our lives. Our character is developed. We see the goodness of the Lord in those seasons of of waiting. Our faith is deepened. He fights for us and his plans unfold. While we wait, oftentimes when we step back and get out of the way, the plans of God will unfold. But yet it's still hard. It's difficult to wait. Difficult for us to be on hold. We don't like to hear those words. Please hold. We don't like to be told, I'm going to place you on hold for a few moments, which sometimes, depending on who you're calling, you can be on hold for a long, long time. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We we don't like that. I know you Gen Zers, you, you don't. You don't talk on the phone very much. You just text. And so you probably don't even understand the concept of being placed on hold. So let me equate it to something you will understand. Being left on red. Same thing. You're texting with somebody, and you see, you can see where they've read the message, and they don't reply to you, and it's hours or days later, and they still haven't replied. We don't like that. But the reality is that there are times in our lives, and we're going to see this from Acts chapter 7, where God will place us on hold. Acts chapter 7, would you stand to honor the greatest book on the planet? We're going to begin to read in verse 23. In my morning devotions months ago, I was reading, and this story was highlighted to me in a really unique way. It says this, one day when Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his relatives, the people of Israel. He saw an Egyptian mistreating an Israelite. And so Moses came to the man's defense and avenged him, killing the Egyptian. Moses assumed his fellow Israelites would realize that God had sent him to rescue them, but they didn't. Notice that. Let me read that again. Moses assumed that his fellow Israelites would realize that God had sent him to rescue them, but they didn't. The next day he visited them again and he saw two men of Israel fighting. He tried to be a peacemaker. Men, he said, your brothers. Why are you fighting each other? But the man in the wrong pushed Moses aside. Who made you a ruler and judge over us? He asked. Are you going to kill me just as you killed that Egyptian yesterday? And when Moses heard that, he fled the country and he lived as a foreigner in the land of Midian. There's two sons were born. Watch. Forty years later. In the desert near Mount Sinai, an angel appeared to Moses in the flame of a burning bush. You probably know this story. And when Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight. And as he went to take a closer look, the voice of the Lord called out to him, I'm the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses shook with terror and did not dare to look. And then the Lord said to him, 
take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their groans and have come down to rescue them. Watch. Now go, for I'm sending you back to Egypt. Watch. So God sent back the same man his people had previously rejected when they demanded who made you a ruler and judge over us. Through the angel who appeared to him in the burning bush, God sent Moses to be their ruler and their savior. And by means of many wonders and miraculous signs, he led them out of Egypt through the Red Sea and through the wilderness for 40 years. Anybody ready for the word of the Lord this morning? Anybody excited about the word of God this morning? You got to do a little better than that. I said, is anybody excited about the word of God this morning? Let's make some declarations before you're seated. Everybody nice and strong, even those watching us online. You ready? Go. I will hide this word in my heart that I might not sin against God. This word is life to my body and health to my bones. I will be a doer of the word. And I am confident of this, that he who has begun a good work in me, in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Listen, Moses' life of 120 years can be grouped into three 40-year segments. The first 40 years of his life were spent as royalty in the court of Pharaoh in Egypt. Second 40 years of his life he spent as a shepherd in the wilderness of Midian. And the last 40 years of Moses' life he spent as a leader for the people of Israel. Now, the first 40 years of his life were really a, a, a pretty luxurious ride. He was there in the courts of Pharaoh in Egypt, and he was enjoying the good life, the cushy life. The reality is that his life was spared at birth from an edict that Pharaoh had passed that said any Hebrew boy that's born, throw him into the Nile River and kill him. Exodus chapter 2 verse 2 says that when Moses was born, his mother recognized that he was special. And so she hid him for three months. I've said to these students in the first service, and I'm going to say to you again, that God sees you as special. And there are times that God will hide us in order to preserve us. God has a way of protecting us from the evil of the enemy, from the plans of the enemy, the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And there are times that we feel like God has put us on a shelf, and the reality is that he's simply hiding you in order to preserve you. Somebody ought to say amen. His mother recognizes he's special, and so she hides him for three months, and she makes a basket, and she lines that basket with tar, and then in an act of great faith, she puts this three-month-old baby into that basket, and she floats him down the Nile River, and he's taken from the Nile River. He's lifted out of the Nile River. As a matter of fact, his name, Moses, means lifted out. His name Moses means taken from. Now listen to me. Uh, God has a way of foiling the plans of the enemy. How many of you are thankful for that? And we see from the life of Moses that the thing that was meant to be his destruction actually becomes his deliverance. Like he's put into the Nile River where he should have been killed and God uses that very thing to be the thing that delivers him and sends him into his destiny. 
Well, somebody ought to get a little bit excited about the fact that the enemy had plans to destroy you and kill you, and God turned those things around so that the very thing that was meant to be your destruction became your deliverance. And I'm going to tell you and remind you today that out of your darkest trials and darkest seasons of life come your greatest opportunities to bring freedom to other people. Let me tell you something. The enemy had plans for you, and it didn't involve you being in RDS. And the enemy thought that the addiction was going to be the thing that took you out. And rather than it being the thing to destroy you, it became the thing to deliver you. He thought the divorce that your parents went through would be the thing that destroyed you. And the opposite has been true. It's the thing that is going to deliver you. He thought that the depression and the trials and the rejection and all the other things that you've experienced in your young life would be the thing that would wipe you out. But God said, I've got a different plan for you. And God takes those things that the enemy tries to use for evil and he works them for your good. Come on, somebody say amen. And that's exactly what he did with the life of Moses. God foils the plans and prepares Moses for his assignment. Even if Moses didn't realize that's what was happening, he's just enjoying the good life. 40 years in the palace and he doesn't realize that man God is preparing him for one of the greatest assignments that we find in the entire Bible. Moses didn't realize that he had been appointed and anointed by God. He just thought he was living his best life. And the reality was that God was taking this man, this baby that had been preserved and protected, and the one who had been delivered from death, from the edict of Pharaoh, was now going to deliver the people of God from bondage and death. Acts chapter 7. Moses is 40 years old. Oftentimes, 40 will represent the end or the beginning of a new season. He's 40 years old and he visits his people and he sees, we read a moment ago, this Egyptian who's mistreating an Israelite and Moses intervenes and comes to the aid of the Israelite and he kills the Egyptian and then the very next day the Bible says he sees two Israelites fighting and he he tries to intervene. He tries to um, be a peacemaker and rescue them. And the Bible says in verse 26 that as he's doing that, one of them, the one who's in the wrong, pushes Moses aside. Verse 26. And he says, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Are you going to kill me like you did the Egyptian yesterday? And then Moses flees to the land of Midian. Here's what you need to understand. And I said this to these students, and I'm going to remind you again that when this happened at age 40, Moses was anointed by God to be the deliverer of Israel. He was the right guy with the right calling, and with the right anointing, but yet he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Wrong place, wrong time. He was called by God. He was anointed by God to be the deliverer of the people of Israel. But yet Moses tried to operate at a time that God had not yet appointed for him to operate in. It's so crucial for you and I to realize that we, although are commissioned by God, sometimes God will send us into a season of waiting and place us on hold so that we can be released into the assignment of God. So the next 40 years of Moses' life, He would be tending the sheep of his father-in-law on the backside of the desert in a wilderness in the country of Midian. He goes from the lap of luxury into the laboratory of learning. And it's in those moments, oftentimes in our lives, and I've been there. You guys don't know my story, but I've been exactly where Moses was where God sent me to the backside of the wilderness. And what happens oftentimes is that in those moments, we might be the right person with the right anointing and the right calling, but in the wrong place at the wrong time, and the enemy will jump on that and try to question, cause us to question everything we've ever known about God. And let me tell you, that's happened to me. 
where we begin to wonder, God, what are you doing? I must have missed you. I must have heard something and misunderstood what you said. Maybe you didn't call me to do this. Maybe you didn't assign me to do this. And some of you over the next nine months are going to have those questions where the enemy comes in and he tries to get you to question everything that you thought you heard. He tries to derail us in that. He tried to do that with Moses, to derail him and, and so that he could never fulfill his assignment. He could never step into his destiny. Being placed on hold often feels like nothing is happening. It's like we just go out into outer space somewhere when somebody says, please hold. And we're just, we don't know where we are. We're just floating around out there in some fiber optic cable or oh, through some wireless uh, internet. We're just out there somewhere. Just we, It just feels like nothing is going on. If you've ever been in the waiting room of a doctor or a dentist and, and you, your appointment is at 1045 and now it's 11 o'clock or it's 1110 or it, it, it's 1120 and they want to penalize us for being late to an appointment and say, we're going to charge you. But yet I just want to charge the doctor sometime because I've sat in the waiting room and I want to go in and say, oh, doc, by the way, you know, I, your office told me that you were going to charge me if I was late to the appointment. And by the way, I'm sending you a bill for $125 because my appointment was at 1045 and it's now 1120. <laughs> Sorry, just a little tangent there. Just my flesh coming out just for a moment. But how many of you have sat in a waiting room and you just feel like nothing is happening? There's that magic door. And you know, if you go behind that door, things are going to happen. Well, yeah, while you're in the waiting room, you've scrolled, scrolled through all your social media. You've looked through the magazines that are out of date there. You've kept caught up on all the, uh, the filthy gossip of a People magazine or whatever it might be. And, and it's just like, it, this is pointless. It's a waste of time. And the enemy wants you and I to think that these seasons of waiting and the season that you're being commissioned into today, maybe it's just a waste of time, unproductive. You're just placed on hold, not really accomplishing anything, not doing anything great for God. But yet all the while, God is developing you. He's shaping you. He's preparing you for a moment of greatness. You see, Moses had greatness in him, but other people around him didn't recognize it. Why? Because it was the wrong place, wrong time. He was anointed by God. He was appointed by God. But they didn't recognize that. As a matter of fact, he was rejected. The one who was in the wrong just shoves him. Can you see? Just both hands in the chest. Bam! Shoves him away. Who made you judge and ruler over us? Rejected by those around him. And that'll happen sometimes when you try to operate in the anointing and the calling of God and people don't recognize the greatness that's in you. They don't understand the calling of God on your life. And they may reject you and say, who, who, who made you our judge? What gives you the right to try to lead us or tell us how we should act, how we should grow in our relationship with the Lord? It's often in those places that people quit. They give up. They derail. They Doubt creeps in. Disappointment disconnects them from their appointment and their assignment. And as I said to these students a few moments ago, and I'm going to say it again, timing is everything. And the timing of God is always exactly spot on when it needs to be. And learning to wait until He releases you into your calling, into your assignment, it's not only crucial for you, but it's crucial for all of the people that you're going to impact and all the people that are going to be rescued through your life and all of the people that are going to be set free from bondage because of Jesus working in and through you. Watch this. I want to read this again. Moses, for 40 years, this is what he heard. Bah! How glamorous is that? 
He's gone from the lap of luxury being in the royal courts of Pharaoh. And now he's on the backside of a wilderness. And, and that's all he hears day after day after day. And, and I, I don't know about you, but I've been in the wilderness seasons before. And, and I love, I love to put God on the clock. Anybody know what I'm talking about? All right, God. All right. I get it. I understand. I know you're... you're Put me in this season for a while. And God, I think, I think a month is going to be good. You might know what I'm talking about. Like we put God on the clock. God, I, I'll give you a month. I think that's good. And uh, man, I know there's a lot that needs to happen. I probably would have said two weeks would have been sufficient. But man, may, may a month, let's double that. A month's going to be probably plenty of time. Because we love to operate on chronos time. Right? We, we put God on the clock. Chronos time looks like this. Well, if I do this, then logically it's going to lead to this. And then that's going to produce this. And then eventually, I'm going to end up right here. Chronos time. But let me tell you something. God does not always operate on chronos time. Because there's two types of time in the economy of God. Chronos time and Kairos time. And Kairos time just simply means without us being able to logically figure it out, God just, boom, drops the divine suddenly on us and said, now's the time that I've decided. Man, we can become so frustrated when it comes to Kairos time. Right? Hello? I mean, I've been there. Trying to figure it all out. God, I'll give you a month and then uh, we should be good. And God says, we don't operate on your time. I'm operating on Cairo's time. And Moses goes to the backside of the wilderness in Midian. And day after day, bah, he's hearing that. And he's in the unglamorous role of serving his father-in-law. And maybe Moses thought, no, I'll do this for a year. I know what I've been called to do. I know what I'm anointed to do. And some of you may have that thought in your head. I'll give this nine months and then God, you owe me. Mm -mm. No, no, no. You don't decide. You don't put God on the clock. You don't bargain with God. You don't make deals with God and tell him what he's got to do because of your yes and your obedience to be here right now. You just stay faithful. It might be nine months. It could be nine years. We don't know. Your job is just to say yes to the Lord and to faithfully walk this thing out. And that's what Moses is doing for 40 years, backside of the desert, tending these smelly sheep, stinking sheep, working for his father-in-law, not having any idea how long this is going to last. And then after 40 years of doing that, all of a sudden he wakes up one morning, he grabs his shepherd's staff, he puts his tunic on, he goes back to the same spot. He's got the same smelly, nasty, bleeding sheep and he's doing the same thing he's done day after day after day after day but yet that day was different he didn't realize that it was going to be different but all of a sudden as he's walking along and the sheep are bleeding and he's just doing his thing there's this bush that's on fire but it's not being consumed and he has this encounter with God there that we read about earlier. And an angel of God speaks to him. And here's the key. God sent back the same man his people had previously rejected. Same guy. Same anointing. Same calling. But it's Kairos time now. It's appointed by God. God says, I'm going to send you back. You were the deliverer 40 years ago. You had the anointing to be the deliverer 40 years ago, but it was the wrong place and the wrong time. Now, however, you're going to stand in front of Pharaoh. I've heard the groanings of my people, and you're going to demand freedom for the Israelites. You still have the same anointing. You still have the same calling, and you're still the same dude. But it's 40 years later, and it's the right place at the right time. And he speaks to Pharaoh, demands the release and the freedom of the Israelites. 
and the timing of God. There's this collision and explosion of destiny of God saying, now I have commissioned you to fulfill your assignment. And let me tell you, the time is going to come for you. You're saying yes to the Lord now, and it's going to translate into some incredible things for you. But you've just got to have the mindset and the mentality that even though I might be placed on hold, and let me tell you, we are commissioning you today into a season of waiting. We're not commissioning you to a certain assignment. We're not commissioning you to fulfill your destiny. We're commissioning you today into a season of just waiting on the Lord. And God will determine how long that is and what needs to be done on the inside of you and what shaping needs to be done. But let me tell you something, and I want you to hold on to this hope. There will come a Kairos moment for each one of you. If you'll stay faithful, there's going to come a moment that God says, "Mm, now you're ready. He's going to put you in front of the right people at the right time with the right anointing and the right calling, and you're going to walk in the destiny and in the assignment of God. Hey, thanks so much for joining us for this message. If God spoke to your heart in a special way, we would love to hear from you. You can reach out to us at testify.therefuge.net. I look forward to you joining us again, whether it's in person or online. God bless you.